I've reviewed a number of NAS devices recently and those were all built to host spinning hard disks with NVMe for caching or additional high performance storage. You can mount SATA SSDs in these also, but I'm of the opinion that this doesn't usually make sense due to the performance uplift versus the cost per terabyte considerations. All these devices had either two and a half gigabit or 10 gigabit per second interfaces. And with the NVMe bays used for caching, they can provide solid performance. But occasionally someone asks the question, why you would use spinning media at all? And the SSDs are the best choice for NAS. So today I'm gonna to look at the F8 SSD Plus NAS from TerraMaster. It's a compact, eight slot NVMe NAS that has a really small form factor. I'm gonna dig not just into the specs and what it's capable of, but actually test and analyze how it really performs. And if an SSD NAS is really a good choice compared to the more traditional approach. So we're gonna start at the beginning and briefly see what you get with the device. As with the other most recent TerraMaster products, it comes in a small and nicely put together retail packaging. Historically, they came across as, I would say, more of a budget end of the market, but the quality of the build has really come along with TerraMaster, and I think the presentation matches this also. If we remove the unit from the box, it's small and contained in good quality plastic case. At the back of the unit, we see that it has power, HDMI, as well as a single 10 gigabits per second network port. Uh, we're gonna talk about this later, um, but it also comes with three 10 gigabit per second USB 3.2 Gen 2 ports. Now underneath we have the accessories and this contains the 10 gigabits network cable and the power brick as you may expect. Um, and the power brick supplies up to 72 watts. There's also a screwdriver and this is for the NVMe installation. There's a pack that contains eight NVMe heat sinks, some elastic band type retainers for securing the NVMe's to the heat sink and some heat pads. I I'm not really sure about this solution, but we're going to look at fitting these in a bit. My main concern is what heat might do to the rubber over time. You could buy some fairly cheap aftermarket heat sinks if needs also, if they do need replacing. And depending on your NVMe, they may not be needed at all, especially with what we will learn about the performance requirements here. If we look at the unit a bit more closely, we see that it's designed to pass air from the bottom over the CPU and NVMe and out the top of the unit. And if we remove this single thumb screw, we can remove the metal chassis from the case and see where the NVMe drives can be mounted. Once done, it's easy to reassemble. Under that larger heatsink is the CPU. And this comes with a really capable Intel i3 N305 CPU, which comes with eight cores and a really low 15 watt TDP. It also has integrated graphics that support 4K transcoding at 60 Hertz with 32 execution units on the iGPU. So it's really capable for transcoding, though the HDMI port isn't natively exposed for content output. Doing this via a media player in the container could be an option as the chipset also supports hardware virtualization. Though, as well as the F8 SSD Plus, there is a base F8 SSD version with an N95 processor. And this is also based on the Alder Lake architect chip with many of the same capabilities. But the N95 CPU comes with only four cores instead of the eight. And the Plus comes with 16 gigabytes of DDR5 non-EEC memory and the base model coming with just eight. Though, both have the same chipset and come with the same 10 gigabits per second networking. And the base model is also considerably cheaper. I'm gonna to come to this at the end because for many, I think it'll do the job just as well. So let's install some NVMEs inside the unit. And here I have three crucial P3 drives and a P3 plus one terabyte sticks, as well as four Western Digital Black SN770 two terabyte sticks. So these are not expensive drives and there is a reason which we will see. But in short, you will want to optimize for price on these SSDs as you're not going to get the full performance out of them for several reasons. But don't get carried away on this yet. I don't think this really matters for most use cases. And I'm gonna explain why once we get to the performance testing um, using Gen 3 SSDs will help with heat also. Installation is easy. Using elastic bands is a bit fiddly, but really it's not so bad. One of mine actually broke, but there are spares in the box and it seems to work fine. But as I said before, I wonder if they will perish over time with the heat from the drives, but I think that's gonna depend on the compound used in the rubber. We're gonna see, but probably not in this video. Probably it's obvious, but you can't hot swap these like you would with hard disks. Then we're gonna install the OS and the unit uses the TerraMaster OS 6 version TOS 6. I'm not gonna go over this in detail as I've talked about TOS 5 and TOS 6 and the differences in other videos, but I'm gonna link those below. But it's worth knowing that despite the software not being as mature or complete as Synology's, for example, it does come with all the things you're likely to really need, including normal NAS file sharing capabilities, support for various array types, and it includes T-RAID, which is a flexible array type that allows you to mix, but still effectively utilize disks of different sizes. And this is really relevant here 
where NVMe prices are going to change and you are likely to want to add or replace SSDs with different sizes in the future. This little box is also very capable from the CPU and memory perspective. Coming with 16 gigabytes and supporting up to 32, you can run VMs and containers on it and it has the power to host these devices, run media servers and do some other very flexible things and it's small and portable. And this is actually one of the coolest things and I'm going to talk about more of this in my conclusions. So now the OS is installed, let's immediately get to the heart of what is one of the most important things here, which is performance, because the main reason that some people cite wanting an SSD NAS is because of this. And this topic is actually nuanced, so I'm gonna try and cover it thoroughly. Firstly, the chipset in both the base and the Plus model is the Alder Lake N, also known as Gracemont. And this comes with only nine Gen 3 PCIe lanes. So if you wanted to run all of your Gen 4 NVMEs at full speed, you would actually need 32 Gen 4 lanes. And there's some additional IO to be used on top of this for things like network and USB, but TerraMaster had to use these PCI lanes carefully. And if we actually look at the lane assignment for all of the eight M.2 slots, we can see that it's only a single Gen 3 lane per slot, which gives around a maximum of 985 megabytes per second per slot. Seeing as most NVMe cards are currently from maybe 3000 megabytes per second up to 7500, at least for Gen 3 and Gen 4, we can see that you won't get much performance out of each card. And if we test the NVMe performance, we can see that all three of the cards used in testing gave around the same performance result, despite having between 3000 and 5000 megabytes per second of performance. And the results are in line with a single Gen 3 lane after the testing overhead. But honestly, I don't think this is a major issue, and I'm gonna tell you why. Firstly, for network exposed access, such as file shares and media, the unit has a single 10 gigabits per second network port. And although this can serve slightly more bandwidth than a single PCI Gen 3 lane, it's only slight. And as soon as you add any kind of disk array, you blow straight past what a 10 gigabits per second network card can deliver. Now you could complain that given the IO potential, the unit should have come with faster networking, maybe two times 10 gigabits, but the vast majority of people do not have 10 gigabits networks anyway and let alone networking hardware to configure link aggregation and use more than that single interface. And even if you could, you still only gives you the network performance of around two Gen 3 lanes. So to me, 10 gigabits per second actually seems entirely reasonable. That said, this device can run VMs and containers, and you may want to provide fast local storage there. So let's look at that. Even with only a single Gen 3 lane from each PCIe slot, if you run RAID 5 or the equivalent T-RAID, you can get about 2300 megabytes per second read speed out of four slots. That's about 20 gigabits per second. So yes, you can get more performance out of NVMEs than NAS can provide, either over the network or locally, but actually it provides more than enough for nearly any use case you might need from this type of device. And if you really need more, maybe you shouldn't be looking at small form factor, low power NAS to solve your problem in the first place. So on this topic, I perform testing on all the possible RAID configurations, and this will show you what local read-write performance you could get, but also how each configuration influences the performance that you can get across the network, assuming you are running 10 gigabits per second. So starting with write performance, running a local FIO test on RAID 0, 5, 6, and the associated T-RAID and T-RAID plus arrays with every possible configuration of up to seven disks, because one disk was used for the system disk and wasn't included, we can see that RAID 0 performance started at about 868 megabytes per second, consistent with the lane limitations on each card. It then increases up to about 3000 megabytes per second at six disks, and then it kind of flattens off. RAID 5 had very similar performance to T-RAID, which I think is to be expected. Again, starting at 868 megabytes per second and rising to 1800 megabytes per second and leveling off. RAID 6 and T-RAID were a little slower due to the additional disk parity, though for T-RAID Plus it appears slower. I suspect this is related actually to the mixed size of disks I use with one and two terabytes both existing in the array. T-RAID and T-RAID Plus allow you to mix disks and get the full capacity, but it would have resulted in some of the storage being on a smaller array, which could have penalized the write performance here a little. And if we look at read performance, we actually see that all of these options performed almost identically. And this would be down to data being retrieved in parallel from all members of the array. The parity doesn't have the impact on reads that it would have on writes. And again, the array started at about 876 megabytes per second, and it reached about 3,200 megabytes per second when all seven disks were used. But if we look at the network performance, this is as expected, and basically showed that no matter the RAID configuration or the disks used, you are going to max out your 10 gigabits network card, and the same is true for write performance and for read performance. 
And as a comparison, I built a six disc RAID 5 hard disk array using Ultrastar discs that have a stable performance of around 250 megabytes per second and performance tested this. And I was about to able to get about 900 megabytes per second read and around 500 megabytes per second write across the array. So although there's a fair performance uplift on the NVMe NAS, it isn't huge as some uh, might have expected, probably two to four times the performance depending on the type of read writes you're doing. And this is because it's primarily down to the network bottleneck. So let's, let's look at the price and what you get for your money compared to using a traditional NAS with hard disks. And here we see a summary of the SSD versions of these NAS units and their closest equivalent hard disk versions from Terramaster. And this is the closest I could find in terms of a like for like comparison. The F8 SSD is closest in spec to the F6 424 six bay NAS with the same CPU and memory with the hard disk unit coming in with two times two and a half gigabits per second ethernet instead of the one 10 gigabits. And it comes with two USB 3.2s instead of the three that you get on the SSD unit. And these are also the same price in USD, GBP and in euros. Then looking at the F8 SSD plus, this has the same CPU and memory spec as the F4 424 Pro 16 gigabytes unit. And again, the hardest unit comes here with two times two and a half gigabytes networking and only the two USB 3.2 ports compared to the 10 gigabits networking and the three USB ports on the SSD model. So the SSD unit here is $150 more expensive at 799 USD compared to 649 USD for the hard disk unit, which would also likely be a little more expensive than the six bay if there were one, which there isn't as the six bay is only currently available in the basic or max version. But typically the markup has been $100 to go from a four to a six bay. So the comparison is pretty straightforward for SSDs and hard disk units with the units matched on price between hard disk variants and the SSD with the same slot counts, CPU and memory. The hard disk variants just come with a little lower external IO and of course populating storage on the SSD variants will be a lot more expensive per terabyte than if you're going to buy hard disks. And comparing the SSD to the SSD plus we see that there's a $200 markup going to the plus and for this you get double the CPU cores at 8 and at double the memory at 16 gigs. But so the choice really comes down to, will you use this? And if the $200 of extra gun is worth your while. So I'm gonna provide the Amazon affiliate links below, and it's probably worth a look around Black Friday, especially as Terramaster often do deals at this time. And in addition, there's always the chance that Taris may be coming on imported hardware to the US. We don't know what will happen there, but let's see how that may affect prices in 2025. We're gonna see if those prices move. Okay, let's get to my conclusions now and my take on where this NAS fits and where it makes sense. But first, please do hit the like if this was useful or you found it informative. I create a lot of in-depth technical content on storage and other enthusiast computer topics. So please do subscribe for this type of content. I do try to go deeper into areas where others don't. So please also share your thoughts on this NAS and if you think it fits other use cases to those that I'm about to talk to now. So let's get straight into that. Firstly, from a performance perspective, you are limited to that 10 gigabit network interface. And there are going to be few who have the networking to exceed this anyway, at least for now. So even if you would have wanted to go with link aggregated to 20 gigabits, you're still gonna fall short of the NVMe bandwidth. So those wanting an SSD NAS for performance should just really consider this. And it turns out that you can get five gigabits per second and upwards in bandwidth from a regular NAS with spinning disks where mass storage is gonna be a lot cheaper. So. I don't think performance itself is the reason to buy this, at least for most unless those margins are really meaningful. And that said, for those that deal with a lot of large files for things like video editing and similar, it does provide a compact and quiet alternative. I know from experience that a NAS with spinning disks can be noisy, especially if you're recording audio content and you need a quiet environment, this option then is ideal. And even during full performance testing all the disks, this unit only drew 36 watts with about 20 watts at, at idle at the wall. So this also brings me to what I think uh, makes this unit most appealing. And that is for those who want a NAS to store media, play across the network, it's an excellent choice. It's small, so it fits unobtrusively into a media center or TV console. It's very quiet, it doesn't produce much heat and it consumes lower power. So this specific unit provides something that is hard to replicate with a build your own solution. It also isn't covered in flashing lights and this could be a plus. Now the base F8 SSD model could also shine here at a lower price. You don't get the same storage density for price as a normal NAS, but you can still deploy 20 terabytes of storage on this and still remain within an optimal price point for NVMEs. Terramaster talk about its ability to provide 64 terabytes of storage, but 
it's worth adding that NVMEs are expensive per terabyte compared to disks, so there's going to be a price paid here. You can pick up a 16 terabyte enterprise grade disk for around the price of a 4 terabyte NVMe currently from one of the cheaper NVMe brands. For a more trusted mainstream 4 terabyte NVMe, you're more towards 18 terabyte disks for price comparisons, at least today. An NVMe cost per terabyte will continue to drop, though so will hard disks. However, putting 8 terabyte NVMe's in this will make the cost explode, with many of those disks being in the $800 to $900 range. So if we look at the current NVMe prices, the sweet spot right now is in the 2 to 4 terabyte range, where drives with more than adequate performance for this can be found for $56 to $60 per terabyte. Now while 8 terabyte drives are often in the $110 range per terabyte, though the WD SN 850X today at least can be picked up from Amazon for about $650, which is down to about $82 per terabyte. Amazon UK has similar prices at around £50 per terabyte in the 2 to 4 terabyte range and £640 or around £80 per terabyte in the 8 terabyte range. But again, these prices vary on a day to day basis. And of course, you can pick up cheaper options, but brands like Crucial, Western Digital, Lexar are solid and competitive. I'm going to put some links below, but do consider that prices fluctuate quite a lot. For example, sometimes the Crucial P3 Plus can be cheaper than the P3, but definitely check for deals especially during events like Black Friday. And I personally use the website camelcamelcamel.com to check that deals really are deals. And although QLC SSDs are likely fine for this application, I personally always have a preference for TLC NAND if I can get them at a similar price point. And finally, on the use cases, the really compelling one for me personally is just how portable this device is. The device is light. It weighs in at 820 grams, fully populated. It uses only a small power brick, and it fits into my laptop backpack well. I travel a lot with work and this device allows me to bring everything I need with me. And because the storage is SSD and not hard disk, there's no real concerns about vibration and G-Shock in transit. And finally, for those willing to pay the extra price for NVMe storage, it's a great unit just to use as a regular NAS. Again, hard disk based NAS are more cost efficient to populate, but if you care about space and noise because you don't have somewhere out of the way to keep it, then this is a great way to stop the sounds of discs performing head sweeps or other background noise of hard disk from disturbing your sleep. So I really love this device. It doesn't replace my other NAV devices in terms of raw capacity, but my data hoarding probably isn't typical. And this is small, portable, quiet and powerful. And its ability to fit eight NVMe drives is fantastic. TOS 6, the native OS is really improving. It isn't perfect. But for the price point, it will give you most of what you need. And if you don't like TOS, as not everyone does, you can easily run something like TrueNAS or OnRaid on this device. So there's lots of options there. So thank you. Don't forget those lights. Let me know how you feel about this device. I really appreciate you watching to the end and I will see you in the next.